hello, welcome to Wild About Gardens. This is a little common frog. Now, those of you who watched my videos may remember that I reared some indoors this year and then released them into this macro pond when they started to sort of get off vegetarian diets. And uh, they're down here all the time now. Um, they're really, so much so that I had to cut the vegetation uh, away from this pond because uh, there wasn't a lot of light getting through. But they're here all of the time and uh, they're about an inch and a half long now. There's three in here at the moment. I just managed to get this little guy as he surfaced, but they're, they're, I'm really pleased. I've got so many that I can't cut my uh, lawn, which is gonna have to be cut at the end of the year, but hopefully they'll have uh, moved off by the time I do it. But normally by this time of year, I would have given it a, um, a quick once over uh, just to chop the, the, the flowers that are seeded down. But I have to leave it at the moment. At the moment, but uh, I'm really pleased that they they've done so well. So, leading on to the questions and the advice I can give about solitary bee habitat. This little bunch of solitary bee habitats here. This is a new one. The upright there. There's not. I think there's one or two or three holes populated, but not a lot. This is east facing. That's really important. That's the the main thing on this list is the position of the insect hotels, solitary bee habitats, whatever you want to call them. These have done quite well. They're near water, which is really important if you can do it. Uh, these have had Osmia rufa, leaf cutter bees, miniature bees, and this, this guy here, look, perfect opportune moment here. This is a leaf cutter bee just finishing off the doorway to his. Uh, his sanctuary there where he's laid larvae in there and he's just stuffing the hole you can see perfect examples of, of, uh, of where they've cut the doorways out here too um, to plug those holes so having leaves nearby for leaf cutter bees is not a bad idea this is east facing now you need to be either east or west facing to allow light to warm up the the, uh, the habitats now East is my preference because the morning light's important. It would it would warm it up and warm the insects up, ready for action. But it doesn't seem to make a difference because when I come home from work uh, about four or five, five o'clock, it's buzzing on the west fence, which I'm going to take you up to in a moment. So east or west is fine. You you could go south facing uh, for if you can do it. Um, but that's that's my preference so if we go up the top we'll continue up there because that's where the most most of my habitats are as you know if we can get through the safari park now my wife keeps urging me to cut to move this one or cut him down but i'm not doing it till he goes to seed because these are really sharp these teasels okay so this is the main area where most of my habitats are so we've mentioned the position east and west and near water if you can. I would say that the second most important thing is they need to be sheltered from the wind. This is to prevent, obviously to, to both to aid the insects from landing because they need to locate the hole they were just at. And if it's windy, this is very difficult for them. So you need to be in a sheltered location. And uh, also that would prevent the rain from splashing into the holes. Not sure if they would know that, but certainly it would help. Now, the roofs, all of, all of my habitats have roofs, but I've noticed over the, the years I've been doing this how important it is. Now, I'm not sure if it's important from shelter from heat. I don't believe so, because in you know they they don't mind flying in the heat it keeps the larvae warm warms up the habitat it could be partially because of that maybe sometimes it gets too hot but i believe more importantly it's from rain and naturally in the wild they would have a preference to a nice sheltered location from above and you can see you know if we use this one as an example this is really obvious here this this is the main 4000 hole guy that i've done and there are, you know, at the bottom here, there, there it has been used, there's, a, there's quite a lot there. 
there's very few at the moment in the middle. I have seen them going in, I saw them a minute ago, but you, as you go up, it becomes obvious that towards the overhang, there is a, a lot going on. And uh, they, there definitely is a preference to having that overhang there, in my opinion. We're talking maybe 50% of the holes have been populated there. So that's, that's a really, really important one, I believe. Somebody wrote in the comments called Kim, thank you very much, about the types of wood and chemicals in particular. And it got me thinking, um, I have added that to the list. You know, is there a preference for older wood? Well, I would say if we cover chemicals and older wood together. I would say they both can play a factor. Now, the, the chemical one, the, maybe bees can detect odour, I don't know. But they would, uh, from, from a you know, pure common sense perspective, I would use wood if you can that hasn't been chemically treated. Now, this one here would have been pressure treated. This is new wood. Um, but it hasn't stopped the bees. Now, the long-term effects of uh, a tannalised wood, I don't know. There are some advantages to using newer wood. When you're drilling it, it uh, tends to be less fibrous. We'll cover that later. Um, and because in nature, new wood is wet and it's uh, sort of more dense because of that moisture. So when you cut a hole, it tends to be cleaner. Um, but certainly, I think go with common sense. If it's got chemicals, try and avoid it. Older wood is good because it replicates nature. Um, and certainly when I've used old wood, it does very well indeed. When you look at the difference between these two, this one is made using older wood and that has always done tremendously well, particularly with the, uh, the miniature bees there, which have the scoper underneath the abdomen you can see they're, they're kind of orange and they tap the flowers i'll have to look up the uh the make and model of that bee but they're, they're kind of they're doing so well in this garden this year i, I would probably guess at a couple of thousand in this on this wall alone uh, so moving on to harder wood now one of the fascinating things i've noticed in the last week was was this guy here now I've started making longer habitats purely because of that overhang and trying to make the, the roof long uh, to try and encourage them to use the whole length of the habitat. This one here was again made in an old fence, fence post and when I was drilling it I noticed that there was a, a knot in the middle which was harder to drill. I didn't pay any attention. However, when I was looking the other night I noticed that the bees certainly do. Now, I don't know if you can see that sort of area I'm talking about. The bees just landing there now. That's much denser wood. You can see the, the holes are cleaner to the holes adjacent to it, which are, again, I mentioned the fibrousness of older wood and, and they certainly do like it less sort of uh, obstructed. And these holes are a lot cleaner and they are, have almost all been used on that knot try and point to it so you know exactly where I'm talking to but there's a bee coming out now you can't miss it and that whole section's been populated as opposed to the left and right which haven't been touched yet I imagine they will move on because they they won't you know it's free it's free uh, accommodation so they, they will use it but there's definitely a preference for more dense wood so if you can get some recycled hardwood you might be onto something there So the depth of the holes, now we've covered this many times, but I believe the deeper the hole can be while still leaving a section behind the hole for insulation is a good rule of thumb. And it's certainly the way I do these. If it's a four inch piece of wood, I try and go two and a half, three inches into it. So going back to the holes, I always, rub down the holes once I've drilled them to make the actual entrance very clean. And that's kind of evidenced again by that knot, which shows that the cleaner the hole, both inside and on the surface, is, is gonna be beneficial and, and a preference to the bees. I always PVA mine, so going back to the chemical issue, 
PVA is kind of pH neutral, it's not harmful, nowhere near as much as other sort of VOC chemicals, volatile organic chem compounds, which I would definitely steer clear of. You know, PVA is kind of a middle ground, it's, it's pH neutral-ish, and I've always PVA'd mine, and that what that does is after I've rubbed them down, drilled the holes, rubbed them down, PVA'd them, what that does, it just toughens up that surface stops water seeping in because then, then no way are they going to go on these habitats if they're soaking wet and the woods kind of soaking wet in nature what i imagine is they're looking for habitats that are sheltered to the point they don't get wet moving on to the chemicals a bit more you know it's, it's a very difficult one because a lot of wood does have chemicals but uh, speak to your local timber supplier to see if they've got off cuts of wood which is what i do Sometimes they'll charge you, sometimes they'll just give them to you and then leave them outside for a, a year or so in, in, the, in the full weather just to let the chemical compounds die down if there are any there. I do put a tilt on some habitats. You can see this one up here is kind of leaning out and that one too, that's a, a one I've sort of reconditioned. It's a very, my oldest one actually, that one. That's about six years old and almost all the holes had been filled so I re-drilled some more. But they've all got tilts along there. And they, they've all got tilts and, and I think, I don't think the bees will notice but it's definitely helpful with the rain. Now the number of holes, this is the final thing really. I started off when I did this and thought, oh, I won't bunch them together too tightly. Uh, and this is the first one I did. And look, they're very spaced out, the holes, and sporadic. And there's no reason to do that. If, you've, if you really want to save as many bees as you can, chuck as many holes as you can in there. And this, this proves it because they're where you'd think they might not want to be in close proximity. Uh, the opposite is true. I've got several species on, on this one, all close to each other, not seeming, seemingly not to care that they're near a hole that's already been populated. In fact, you might argue that it's strength in numbers and that there's less chance of their nest being predated by a, a sort of Ichnamon wasp or a, a parasitical wasp um, if it's close to loads of others when the, the choice is there. For, for the wasp and this this would prove it I mean they're up at the top here it's all it's like a little city they've, they've just populated most of the holes up there so don't worry about the number of holes in a habitat the more the better you'll get more bees and there's more choice for the bee um, I think that's about it that there, there aren't many other things that are important but if I think of them I'll add them to the comments below if you can think of any others please let me know because I'd be interested in hearing them. I hope this is of some benefit. Please uh, subscribe and, and, uh, and like the videos. I'm trying to raise money for the World Land Trust, which is a really, really important charity here in the UK that, that works worldwide and, and of whom David, that David Attenborough is the patron. So it's a very renowned charity and they save rainforest all over the world. So pop off and have a look at their website. It's, it's very, very interesting and uh, thanks for the support. What about sunrise? What about rain?